That's so true. To get into the final here, it means you've gone round this course at maximum pace almost four times. Those who have only done the time trial earlier and didn't make it through to the quarterfinals, you could argue, yes, they're well rested, but they don't get any opportunity to pick up on any of the bonus seconds. Sure, but if you were trying to win the Tour de Ski, would you be too concerned if you'd finished 31st, 32nd in qualifying and didn't get through to the knockout phases? I don't think so. When you look at this, the third day of racing, this is intense, hard, hard racing. It doesn't put you out of the tour if you haven't made it into the top 30 today, especially yeah. in the men's field. Yeah, I, I agree. I think I think there's a big difference between the men and the women. So we've already mentioned the top five sprinters from this event last year came uh, in the top five of the tour standings come the end of the week. In the men's, the only man who did well here and went on to do well in the tour was Petter Nortug, who finished second in both. Yes, he, he absolutely did. Well, Petter Nortug today, he's lo losing the pace at the moment, but we know that he's got that terrible finish. Yeah, he can always afford to uh, just ease off a little bit coming up the last climb, save something for the uh, sprint finish. Now we're going to see whether he's got he's got himself into second place. That's uh, perfect positioning. He should be able to get into the slipstream of his teammate, Ostensen, who's just in front. The Canadians with uh, Alex Harvey will be cheering on the red and white suit. Little unsteady there from uh, Cyril Miranda, I think that was, having all sorts of problems. Getting tied up also with Martin Yax of the Czech Republic, who's dropped back down into fifth, into the home straight now. Petter Norto just turns it up, makes up inches on Ostensen. Another 30 metres to go. Ostensen still with the first place, looking for automatic qualification. It could be Norway one and two, but Alex Harvey, Harvey is not far out. Well, Harvey gets it at the moment. Nortug down into third. We'll wait to see if that is confirmed. Looked as though, for me, Mike, as though uh, Nortug was just ahead. I, I thought it was Alex Harvey just ahead uh, okay. on, on the line. <laughs> he, um, because Nortug just backked off. He tried reaching his foot out about uh, just two, mistimed it. two meters too early, I yeah. think. Yeah, OK, well... Uh... And I think I think he whacked his shoulder. The the red uh, wooden bar is beneath the snow, and I think he landed quite badly on that uh, on the red wooden uh, finish line, effectively. Well, it won't bother him. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a look. Uh, you've got uh, Petter Norto. We've got a big faller. That's, uh, that's Martin Yax. Yeah, that's Yax of the Czech Republic going down, coming into the home straight. We've got Ostensen in the middle. We're pretty sure he's got the win. Now, I don't think he hit the wood, but I do think he landed awkwardly on that right-hand shoulder. Impossible to tell from that angle. It's impossible to tell from our angle, and so we have to wait and see. But at the moment, Alex Harvey may well have gone through. The winning time from Ostensen, 232.3, and the lucky loser, Norton, 232.6. So it doesn't look as though that is quick enough to qualify him. And uh, that would be a real blow to his tour standings. Norton has got it, and... Uh, I mean, Harvey's got it, Nortuk has to wait and see, but uh, Simon Ostensen, well in control. He's uh, ha happily there to win it, you're comfortable. Second, you're still comfortable. Jochen Be Baylor, the uh, head coach of the German team, and of course, uh, a very good race, a former World Cup winner uh, in his time, uh, although some would say he won the, the very first wave start that took place in Canmore. Uh, many, many years ago, I think we've got to go all the way back to 1985, uh, and a number of uh, athletes protested at the change in format. My goodness, they've got a thing to learn because the change in format, if, if we hadn't had anything, we wouldn't have the sprints today. We wouldn't have the pursuits, we wouldn't have the mass starts. And I think most people would say that, that those are now the, the, the uh, events of the cross-country skiing World Cup. Yeah, they've, they've lifted the cross-country, uh, it's certainly viewing figures, the excitement. Jesper Modin there, tallest man in the field, nearly two metres tall. Will this course suit uh, the large figure? He is very good in sprint racing, is Jesper Modin. Yeah, he uh, was the quickest over the first half of the prologue course, but then blew up. Hopefully, slightly shorter today at 1.2 kilometres as opposed to 3.6. He can do something. Modin in the middle of your screen in the white suit. The Russians in this heat. We've got Alexei Pechikov. Watch out for him. Devastating speed, wearing 19. And we've also got... Uh, We've also got Nikolai Morilov, who uh, we've seen uh, on many, many occasions. Morilov, uh, a real talent, Mike, wearing two, leading the way at the moment. Morilov looking quite comfortable at the front there. This is another uh, great heat when you've got Morilov 
Petchukov, although Petchukov only qualified in 19th. I thought he'd make the top five. Number 12 is Peter Kummel of Estonia. Sebastian Eisenlauer of Germany wearing 22. Just uh, tucked in in third, fourth place as they go up the hill in pairs. Modin on the far side. We've got Morilov on the near side. The second pairing of uh, Peter Kummel. And, of course, Germany's Sebastian Eisenlauer. Eisenlauer, only one of two Germans to qualify in the top 30 from the run out earlier this morning. I'm a little surprised we didn't get at least four Germans in the top 30. Well, it always helps to be in front uh, when, when it comes to the sharper corners. It allows you to take exactly the line you want. Now they uh, just uh, jostle for position. Morilov <laughs> hardly being courteous to Jesper Modin, but uh, he gets away with it. And uh, all six continue up the hill, the biggest of the two climbs, and they power their way over the top. Good move coming in from uh, Russia's Alexei Petchikov, 19, on the inside. Very well thought out, Mike, because he knew the course at the top was shorter on the left hand side he's gone for that and he's gained himself two three meters and uh, that uh, could be crucial Do you know what that's a, the very intelligent way to run this race which Petrikov has done he didn't get too excited on the first major climb but he positioned himself beautifully on the inside for the second climb yeah now it's a question of uh, making everyone else work three meters doesn't sound much but uh, when the man in front of you is going uh, flat out it's very very difficult to get past him into the home straight now and Petrikov goes for the Double polling power that we've seen from him before. Great skills from Nikolai Morolov. He's steaming up on the outside. And I'm afraid Sweden's Jesper Modin is left for cold. Watch the clock, 2.32 dead. The quickest qualifying time so far. And that is absolutely thrash. 2.30.7. And that is good for Jesper Modin because at the moment he has the fastest lucky loser time. Uh, well done to Jesper Modin. That was so fast and the Russian boys made it look so easy. Yeah. Well, that uh, has to remind you of the Olympic final. It, it does, and they've worked so hard. They've got a great sprint program, and there's so many other great Russian athletes who aren't making it onto the World Cup, but very good in sprint. You, you suspecting that Petchikov, uh, this may be his last race in the Tour de Ski? Yeah, I think so. We saw him yesterday. He came only 64th in the 15-kilometre up in Oberhof, and uh, tomorrow it's a 20-kilometre. Well, it's a... It's a double pursuit, so it's 10 kilometers classic followed by 10 kilometers skate. I think he'll lose. sacrifice World Cup points, a lot of money. Possibly, maybe we'll see him lasting until the next stage of the sprint races. But uh, if he can last that long, but a uh, great performance there. Well, that's a very impressive run. The fourth of the five first round heats and uh, the Russians, I think, will be delighted. Petchikov, Marilov have gone through 2.30.7 now, the quickest qualifying time, the fastest time for a lucky loser at the moment, 2.31.9, and that goes to Sweden's Jesper Modin. We've only got one heat left, so he's, uh, he must be feeling quietly confident as we look at confirmation of the results of heat number four. Now, the tour leader, Dario Colonia, in the red bib, of course, former overall World Cup winner, and Colonia back to that sort of form we've seen it he's promised it and uh, I, I don't think he could have done anything better to prepare himself for the Tour de Ski this year Legkov, Heikkinen, Tim Schenker of Germany watch out for him wearing 18 David Hoffer of Italy and Chris Freeman of the United States 28th fastest in qualifying if he gets through this uh, it will be a miracle but <laughs> Stranger things have happened. Yes, absolutely. And with uh, well, the North Americans doing well so far, who knows? But I think Legkov, he'll just do his normal bullish tactics, just charge on and probably place himself top two throughout this whole heat. Yeah, Legkov, the leader of the men's World Cup standings at the moment. Uh, major adjustments, of course, are made at the end of the Tour de Ski, but he was leading coming in ahead of Kolonia and Viligzanin. Viligzanin not racing in the Tour. Failed a blood, not a doping test, but uh, a hematocrit test prior to the Tour, and he was banned from the first day's racing. That's uh, an unfortunate mistake from Matti Heikkinen of Finland in the middle of your screen. Almost, almost planted the pole between the legs, but uh, luckily for him, it came down on the ski so he got away with it there's so much you can't afford many errors you don't often get away with one error in, in the sprint races two minutes 32 seconds of all-out uh, battling 
Yeah, I think we saw that in the uh, in the race yesterday, Mike. The Pursuit 15-kilometer race. Make one mistake, one trip, and really you're you're out of contention. And if you went for a break and you failed to make it, you were not going to win. Colonia played a very canny game indeed. It was a patient race, but he was always perfectly positioned. Yeah, comfortably in the top five when you got well. What do we have, 74, 75 people started? And he did it without too much effort. He didn't have to muscle his way to the front. I think he's shown a fair amount of respect on the tour and hence said no one's going to push him out the way. But uh, it really was a race of experience. He leads at the moment. So Colonia over the top of the first hill in the perfect position. We've got uh, Russia's Alexander Legkov also in this heat and he's looking good, but he's dropped back a little. Second place at the moment, Mike. I say Chris Chris Freeman yeah. looking very comfortable. It's an incredibly fast pace, Patrick, and that's why the others are being dropped at this time. Yeah, being dropped. They've been absolutely uh, blown away. Tim Schenker of uh, Germany is off the pace. We've got David Hoffer of Italy who's struggling to stay with it at the moment. But it's Colonia of Switzerland who leads. Again, he goes for high tempo. Colonia qualifying in third fastest at 228.89. If he gets anywhere near that time, he's going to drag one of these men to a lucky loser position because they're all digging deep trying to stay with the Swiss number one. I cannot believe the intensity that Colonia is hitting this. He desperately wants to be safe to qualify into the semi-final and he's, he really is putting himself in a safe position at the moment but are you thinking about the semi-finals? Burning, you know, when you burn at this pace, it's difficult to come back in, what, 15, 20 minutes, 15 minutes to till his next race, if, yeah. he, if he wins. Over the little bridge at 2.08, that is some half second uh, to three quarters of a second quicker than we saw from Alexei Pechikov, who recorded a time of 2.30.7. If they can keep the pace going down the home straight, this could be something special. 2.25, 26, 27, Dario Colonia is going to cross the line first. He's eased right up, he was well capable of going under 2.30 and uh, Legkov gets a qualifying time as well. Heikkinen has to wade and two C 2.32.8 for him. I'm not sure that is quick enough. Yes, but Modin has certainly got a lucky loser spot and we have to wait and see. Will it be Petr Nautic? I think it might be Yaropov of Russia who gets the other lucky loser spot who raced in heat number two because he had a time of 2.32.2. So Modin and Yaropov are the two lucky losers. As we saw from that heat, Kolonia and Legkov, the two fastest qualifiers, men who both lie in the top three of the tour standings at the moment. They have gone three through. And, uh, well, if you put money on uh, Dario Kolonia a couple of weeks ago to win the Tour de Ski, I think you will be rubbing your hands with glee. He's looking so good, Patrick, but Legkov, we can never forget Legkov. He's, he's not really the out-and-out -out sprinter, Legkov, but he didn't let go. He only dropped back to third once, kept in the top two, 95% yep. of that race. And looks strong in the finish. If he can uh, get a good position today, Discussions in the German team. I don't think they're going to be too happy. Uh, Sebastian Eisenlauer has gone out. Tim Schanker nowhere to be seen in heat number five. Finished down in fifth position, 5.9 seconds off the pace set by Dario Colonia. So uh, no wonder that Jochen Baylor not looking too pleased. It's testing times for him, Mike, because uh, the first five years of his reign, everything went to plan. Everything went went so well and he said after the poor start up in Scandinavia he said hey don't worry there's the world championships and the tour de ski but they haven't done that well so far Welcome back to Obersdorf, round three of the Tour de Ski. Remember, it's uh, a 10-day race, eight races in those 10 days. We've had two days racing in uh, Oberhof, uh, a long drive from uh, the east of Germany across to the west for uh, the next two days. And uh, already they've done the qualifying, they've done the first round. We're through to the semi-finals of the women's. And which of the two semi-finals would you like to be in, Mike, in terms of ease? <laughs> well, Ease, I think this one, the first of the two, is slightly yeah. better with Saarinen and Kowalczuk in the second. But yeah. we can't underestimate anyone in this first well, heat. Well, you've also got Jakobsen in the uh, second heat. And uh, when she's on form, as we saw back in 2007, she's very good. You've got Saarinen in there. Charlotte Kaller is in there. So uh, maybe Petra Magic has struck lucky getting into 
semi-final number one. Magic in yellow. Alongside her, Prashashkova in four for uh, the Slovak team. We've got Marianne Longer in six. Osterberg of Norway, seven. Madoka Natsumi, ten. And it uh, be interesting to see how she gets on. There she is, wearing number 10 in the middle of your screen at the moment. But there is no doubt that Petra Madic, who had the fastest qualifying time, is going to control this one from the front. She is. I, I thought she had quite a slow start there, Patrick, but she, she just seems very, very relaxed. And uh, it easily took her to the front. And uh, as, as you say, 